we're going to talk about um, kind of fatigue in general. This might be a bit elementary for, for many of you in the room, but we'll, we'll start from a common place and, and kind of describe what we're trying to do when we're testing for fatigue. Look at a quick real life example and then look at approaches we have in two pieces of software. The first being SolidWorks Simulation, which is the embedded FEA analysis tool um, that's available for purchase with SOLIDWORKS. And then we'll also talk about um, a more advanced fatigue analysis tool called FE Safe, which is part of the Simulia Abacus portfolio, which is a, another line of analyst level finite element analysis tools that we've uh, been working with over the past three or four years. And we'll contrast the differences of what's possible. So, you know, first of all, what is fatigue and what are we trying to detect or assess when we talk about doing a fatigue analysis or fatigue testing? So the Wikipedia d dictionary definition of, um, of fatigue, that is it is the weakening of material caused by repeatedly applied loads. Um, relates to progressive and localized structural damage that occurs when a material is subjected to cyclic loading. And basically we're talking about a failure that occurs um, and most of the research, most of the understanding of this around metallic materials, but it certainly applies in other areas. Um, we're talking about a failure that occurs when the loading is not high enough to cause yield or ultimate failure, but re repeated applications of that loading um, cause a failure at some point during its design life. And the example on the bottom right is a metal bar um, that's failed due to fatigue. The dark gray area of that is, um, is the area where a crack developed and repeated loading caused kind of incremental progress of that crack. And then the bright, shiny area is the catastrophic failure that occurred when that crack got big enough to cause total failure of the of the object. And so you know often when you're looking at kind of a forensic assessment of the cause of failure of different things, you're looking for patterns of this type. Um, that indicate that it was caused by a by a fatigue failure. So the challenge with fatigue is that it takes a long, uh, sometimes a very long amount of time um, for that failure to manifest. So while we can take a you know a prototype part and subject it to its design loads, um, we know instantly if it's going to fail due to being overloaded or yielding or whatever it might be, because as soon as you run that test, it either falls apart in pieces on the floor or it holds the load successfully. Fatigue's a little trickier to physically test in that we need to repeat that load a million, two million, five million, ten million cycles, um, and so it can be a very time-consuming process to understand if you're going to have fatigue failure physically. So we turn to theory, uh, we turn to textbooks, we turn to analysis methodology in many cases to make a prediction of the fatigue life. If any of you guys have been in IKEA, I'm sure you've seen they often have their fatigue tester for, for chairs out, in a, out on the shop floor, just repeatedly applying a sitting load to, um, to a particular piece of furniture. So one of the kind of classic fatigue failures um, that highlights a couple of the, the key characteristics of testing for fatigue is um, the de Havilland Comet 1, which was the first commercial jet airliner. It was launched uh, in the mid-50s or early 50s to, to great fanfare and um, it was all going great until in a single year, three Common airliners broke up in flight and were, were total losses. Um, they immediately suspended the, the use once they figured out they had a, a sequential a systematic failure. 
suspended the use of them. And if you go back and look at the testing records, you know, the fuselage itself was designed to withstand three times operating pressure. It was tested to that level. Fuselage itself was tested through 16,000 flight cycles. Should be more than enough 40 years of design life for an airliner. Um, yet failure was occurring in these three aircraft between 900 and 2,700 flights. So, you know, somewhere around 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 pressurization and depressurization cycles were causing a catastrophic failure to occur. Um, so there's a significant um, so it's a significant amount of testing that went on here. I think I might have hidden the slide here. Let's just take a look. Anyway, so the, there's a couple of um, a couple of key things that were discovered as a result of this failure. The failure was eventually tracked to a um, an instrument win window, which is similar to the the passenger windows you see here. And what's unique about these, if we look back on them today, is that they're all square. Okay, and so that square shape developed a fairly intense stress concentrator at the corners and um, increased the, you know, drastically increased the stress in the airframe, um, putting it much closer to the fatigue zone or in the fatigue zone. The other major contributor is that um, the, the methodology used to to fit the, the window frames and those sort of things was a riveting a punch rivet process, which is a pretty abrupt process and was developing a lot of initial, initial cracks in the material. So kind of the two factors in the recipe, you've got the high stress concentration. And you know when we look at our own fatigue testing, we we can't just write off you know small zones of high stress as, as being not relevant because of that. And we also need to make a consideration of how our manufacturing processes might be affecting the material because if we start off with a bunch of initial cracks they're going to propagate a lot faster than um, you know a virgin material might do. So that's just a little bit of background and you know cases like this this one particularly have led to a lot of fatigue development over the last 50 years and so a lot of the science that we you know we know of today comes out of these these failure events. Um, the original kind of fatigue methodology, the first crack at you know understanding fatigue, came from a bunch of railroad shaft failures in in Europe in the mid 1800s. So we've got a few different methodologies for investigating fatigue, and the one we use in Solberg simulation is called a stress life fatigue assessment. And basically that says we can predict the life of something based on understanding the stress that's present in the object. Okay, so we're comparing the stress level in the component to the number of predicted cycles to failure at that stress. Uh, there were these, and the driving piece of data for that is something called an SN curve. It is required to do a fatigue analysis in SOLIDWORKS simulation, and you know it represents a whole batch of testing that's been done on a particular material sample, subjecting it to different stresses, and alternating that stress over and over for millions of cycles. You can see the data in this chart showing goes from 10,000 to 10 million cycles on that log scale. Um, and we understand a fatigue life for that material. Uh, the test is conducted under particular loading reversal condition. Um, normally we call this an S value. 
it's either zero or minus one. The S ratio is the peak stress divided by, sorry, the, the minimum stress divided by the peak stress. So if it's something that's fully reversed where we load it forwards and backwards, that ratio comes out to minus one. When something is zero based where we load it, load it and then remove the load, that ratio comes out to zero. And there's a few different resources you can find these sort of materials. Um, you know, some web sources like materiality.com, which is something you'll get a subscription to uh, with a license of SolarWorks Simulation Professional, an active license. Um, but other resources I've used, are, you know, fatigue metal textbooks, um, some standards will list fatigue information. Um, the one I come back to most often for metallic stuff is uh, something that used to be called Military Mill Handbook 5J. Um, it's now called the MMPDS. And you didn't hear it from me, but you can find copies of that floating around the web in different places. Yep. And in SolidWorks Simulation, we, we just provide kind of one piece of sample. Uh, one sample curve to give you a sense of how to input the information. We do provide an approximation methodology based on the elastic modulus. That's an okay approximation for steel. Um, but yeah, I encourage you to find something else to do first. So when we look at the SolidWorks simulation offering, right? Solid, uh, fatigue is available uh, in all of the dedicated simulation packages. So it doesn't come with SOLIDWORKS Premium, but it is available with SOLIDWORKS Simulation Standard, Professional, and Premium. And so let's um, sit down and take a look at, at how the fatigue, you know, how fatigue process works inside of SOLIDWORKS Simulation. And the sample I'm going to use for all the testing today is a piece of a of a backhoe assembly, and we're going to look at the, the kind of long arm that connects to the bucket of, of this, uh, this backhoe. And so, because we're using a stress life process for fatigue, the first thing we need to do is make an assessment of what the stresses are in this object. We have a fantastic tool for doing that. It's called a static stress analysis in SOLIDWORKS. And that's what we're going to use to determine the stress levels of all the events that we want to consider. From there, we create a fatigue study, pull in some material information, tell the software what events, what are actions this thing needs to work through in its lifetime, and we run the analysis. So what does that look like? You notice I've got this part in isolation right here. That's just for simplicity of doing this with you here today. It's everything here is just as applicable in an assembly. Okay, so we can go ahead and set up. Um, well, actually, I already have one here. I've got a stress analysis already in place. It's pretty straightforward stress analysis. Define the material of this component as a 304 steel, so a generic steel. In terms of the any connections or contact, we only have a single part. So we've got nothing to worry about there. Um, I've defined some restraints at the top end. This is where it'll connect to the to the next member in the backhoe linkage, um, and I've just I have it being held at two holes, right? In a certain position, it would kind of be locked in those two holes. So that's fine. And then I've defined a loading at the end of this object. And that loading is representative of the load that would be seen by this object when we're digging, um, making a dig action, right? We're pushing this thing into the ground essentially to to drive the bucket in and extract a, a certain volume of, of soil 
or whatever the whatever the material is. All right, so pretty straightforward. I put 9,000 pounds um, per item across two faces. That's about 18,000 pounds of load on this. So we can go ahead and run this analysis. You know, the two phases that the software has to go through is to mesh. Oh, oh, what? All right, we can probably do a bit better on this mesh here. We want to get a couple of elements through the thickness, but good enough for a demonstration example. And we run the analysis and we understand our stress levels. Uh, we can obviously put these into whatever unit system we're most comfortable with. Let's go PSI. That's how I like to think. And so we're looking at a material that has a yield strength, 30,000 PSI. We've got some high stress areas up to about 25, 26,000 PSI. That's only a factor of safety of 1.2 1. 1, or 3. Well, I can tell you for sure, 1.15. Um, so probably not the best design. We might want to be looking at this. But we can also sense that when we clip this, you know, my high stress areas are generally pretty localized to, you know, around the holes and maybe in here. Notice that one of the holes, this hole has no restraint on it, but it's acting as a stress concentrator. And we've got high stress around that hole, sorry. Um, you know, the high stresses around this hole are generally from the fact that it's acting as a restraint, but this is just from being a stress concentrator. Um, they would be even worse if it was square, not round. And then we've got a bit of a stress. Oh. Yeah. So, you know, all those are interesting um, from pure stress perspective, but then we can go put them into an assessment of fatigue. Right? So we create a new study. We define a fatigue test. And in here, we, we just, our first action is to define what stress study describes the loading action or actions that I want to consider. So when I come here, you know, I, I can approximate a design life or define a design life for this, this object. Um, let's say I need this to withstand 100,000 gig cycles. It's probably quite low, but we'll go with it for now. And, you know, let's also assume that a dig event is a, a one-way load, right? When we push this thing down into the ground, it's resisted by the soil. Um, but then when we lift it back up again, it's, let's assume for to start with that it comes up, it's free. It's not loaded. Now in reality, um, it's going to come up with a bucket full of material, which is going to weigh something. It's going to have some sort of load. So we may want to come in and look at the loading history in more detail. But for now, we can assume that when we push down to dig, it's fully resisted. When we lift up, let's assume that there's zero load on it at that point. And that would be zero based. And so we have these options of how this loading acts. All right, fully reversed is when you push down, it's resisted. And when you pull up, it's resisted at the exact same amount. Zero based is an on off load. And then this loading ratio, we could say, hey, when it pushes down, it's fully resisted. But when I lift it up with a bucket full of uh, material, you know, that's 40% of the downward load. And so we could set a loading ratio of a certain value to, to capture that. All these three things are doing are determining the um, determining the amplitude of the alternating stress, whether that's two times the stress that I have or just one time or some variable of it. Okay, but that's what we're defining. And so this is the event we're setting up. Now when we define that, the software says, hey, I'm going to go get the material definition from, um, from that study. 
and then we get the ability to apply fatigue data. And right here's where we can either read in a curve, um, of a certain material, right? And the best way to do this is to put the data you need into Excel or some other kind of tabular format and then just copy paste right into the, the software here. Make very sure that you've got the, the correct unit that your data is provided in defined here or else you'll get nonsense. Um, when you look at fatigue test data, it will normally indicate the stress ratio and that represents the conditions under which the test was conducted. So when we did our test on our coupon, you know, we fully reversed the loading when we did the test. And so this value here should reflect the conditions of the test, not the conditions of the analysis you're doing. Um, and it will scale the data appropriately to map the test conditions to the analysis conditions. Now I'm going to cheat here and I'm going to use a kind of a derivation or an approximation of a fatigue curve. Um, there's a couple of methodologies the software provides. You know, you, you wouldn't swear by them to make a design decision, but they can be a good way to inform a design decision or do a preliminary analysis. But basically this compares stress levels in the material to how many cycles it'll take to fail at that material. Um, sorry, at that value. So, you know, where, if we get a PSI, I knew that my loading was about 20 something thousand. I'm expecting, based on reading this curve, somewhere between 20,000 and 50,000 cycles. Shoot. Maybe a bit higher, maybe 5,000 and 10,000. Okay. And so that's that's it that we're going to look at for now. For fatigue analysis, we run the analysis, it runs very quickly. Um, uh, we've got 223,000 as a prediction of the minimum life, 223,000 cycles. You might say, hey, that doesn't wash with um, with what you saw on the curve, All right? You know, if I, my load was about just under 2,000, 20,000 PSI, right? Shouldn't we be down somewhere around here, around 100,000? What's actually happened is this test was done with a fully reverse load in real life in the test that we've performed. We had a zero base load so it will have halved the loading or made some approximation of the loading um, to bring it further down the chart. All right, so it'll make that approximation for you. Um, but even still, you know, the classic argument is why do I need a piece of software to look up that curve when I could just grab the curve and look it up myself, right? And in a pure case, you know, you you have a point. Um, but there's a couple of other things that are going on here. Right? So the first one is that not only is the alternating stress an important part of making a fatigue prediction, but the mean stress about which we oscillate also has a contributing effect. Um, in a situation that is fully reversed, the mean stress is zero, and we actually don't need a correction in that case. But in the situation we looked at now where we've got a peak stress and we go back to zero, um, my mean stress is, is non-zero and it will contribute. And the diagram on the bottom right might seem familiar, it's called a fatigue diagram or Goodman diagram or different things. Um, and this compares the alternating stress in the model and the, and the mean stress in the model, in the component. And anything under one of these three lines, which are based on different mathematical formulations, um, anything under those three lines could be considered safe. Anything outside would be considered a failure. 
and we have three methodologies for defining that line, and those are built into SOLIDWORKS. Um, one is a good approximation for brittle materials, the Goodman theory. Gerber is a good approximation for ductile metals. And the Soderbergh is, is a more conservative approach that you can take if you want absolute certainty. And so we access those controls um, through the properties of the fatigue study. We've got three options, four if you include none for mean stress corruption. This is a ductile metal. I'm going to choose Gerber. I'm going to reprocess the analysis, and we'll see that has affected the prediction of minimum life. Uh, some people find it counterintuitive that red is safe and blue is good. Um, so many stress plots we look at have the opposite. So if you do want to manipulate that, just double click and under color options, there's a flip option, and that means red is bad, blue is good, if, uh, if that concerns you. Um, but you know, we've got a prediction here of about 200, just under 200,000 cycles before we would expect to see based on this info, some sort of fatigue failure at that position. There's another way we can look at this data. This life plot makes sense. It's very easy to think about when we've got a single load. Okay. It gets a lot more challenging when we start including multiple loading histories. So instead, we use a formulation um, called damage. Okay, and what this is basically saying what this is basically saying is this percentage isn't reporting quite right, but it's saying that value should be fifty percent. Okay, so it's saying that after 100,000 cycles, which was the loading history I asked it to go through in the event, we've got 50% roughly of the way to using up our fatigue life. And it's just, it's saying the same thing. My first life plot said it had 200,000 cycles in it. Um, the This one here saying, at 100,000 cycles, we're 50% of the way to failure. Let's do the same thing. Uh, but it becomes useful when we start looking at multiple loads, and we use a, you know, a theory that was proved or that was developed called Miner's Law, which basically says, you know, if you're assessing the ability of something to fatigue under multiple different loading actions, you can just take the sum of this damage parameter and add them up, and as soon as that the sum of all these different inputs exceeds one, you've got a failure. All right? So if doing a dig action 100,000 times uses up half of the fatigue life, and we use the backhoe to I don't know, push over trees 50,000 times, and that uses up 25% of the fatigue life, um, we're still safe. But if we then also get it to go do a grading action another 200,000 times, and that uses another 30%, we'd expect the fatigue failure. So it's, it's a nice, this theory of damage, or this concept of damage, just means we can sum the various um, actions of different, um, of different loading actions and kind of see how much life we have left. So Solbox is also able to address multiple conditions in a single study. And so to, to kind of simulate that, I've set up a second uh, design case here, what I call a grading event. So I'm kind of pushing the bucket along a smooth or along a rough surface to try and make it smooth, um, which would translate to a loading on the bucket attachment, pushing horizontally. And I can go run that and get stress levels, right? A little bit of a lower peak stress from this sort of action, different pattern, obviously. 
right? And then in a fatigue study, when I'm setting up the event, I just add events twice. So I have my dig event runs 100,000 times. It's zero based, okay? So on off my grade action, I'm doing 50,000 times, but I'm doing it fully reversed. So I'm saying that when I do grading, sometimes I push and sometimes I pull. All right, might make sense. Um, and so we put those together. So I can now set up two different actions that happen on different time schedules. So over the life of this thing, it digs 100,000 times and it grades 50,000 times with different actions and combine those things together in a single assessment of fatigue. We can go run that. It still has the same material. We can go run that. And when we have multiple actions, we no longer see a life plot, right? It's just not easy for us to say it's good for 100,000 cycles because that does that mean cycles of the first event or cycles of the second event? Um, but we can say that after this, you know, loading, this one's reporting correctly, we're using up, you know, basically 2.4 design lives. All right, so we're causing the thing 2.4, um, it's, it's failing two times over with these actions in place. So I would need to go have a look at, um, you know, at making those loads smaller or stiffening the part or, you know, adding other material or changing the, the material. So we would have a failure under these conditions right now. In fact, anything, let's see if we can do ISO clipping again. We'll set that to 100, which represents failure. Right, anything highlighted here has potential for fatigue failure. So around both of these holes and also some stuff um, around the central plate there. And so there are, there are other things that SolidWorks simulation can allow us to do. Um, one is a tool called Find Cycle Peaks, and that's a way to assess for a particular model that contains both alternating loads and constant loads um, to assess the fatigue behavior of that. And the way you do it is you set up two studies. So let's imagine we have a pressure vessel or something like that. And if it's two studies, the first study has all the maximum loads that it might see. It might see a, you know, a high temperature causing expansion, causing stress. It might see the peak pressure we're rating this pressure vessel to. It might see the preload from the bolts that's being used to, to bolt on the flanges. And then we compare that to a second study which only which has the kind of the minimum loads, the loads that are always there. For a pressure vessel, we never empty the pressure vessel completely. There's always some sort of residual pressure that's in place most of the time. Um, so we, we put that in place. And we the bolt preloads, we don't tighten and loosen those with each loading cycle. So they're always there, so we put that in place. And uh, what the fine cycle picks is it looks at it element by element figures out the difference in stress between study one and study two and uses it as the alternating stress for that for that element to make a fatigue prediction. Uh, the other thing we can do is use variable loading histories. Right? Instead of just on off or zero based, we can go get a you know a histogram of um, you know particular action. What we're looking at at the bottom of the screen there is a measure of the, the loading and acceleration. Um, from an automobile suspension over, you know, a few hours of driving, um, and we can use this as a as a control for the fatigue input, and it will basically tell us how many times we can scan through a loading block like this before we see failure. And we also have some capability that's new in SolidWorks 2015, so it's been with us a couple of releases now. Um, to do fatigue prediction for harmonic and random vibration loading histories. 
Um, it's using something called Baskin's equation. Um, it's a relatively simple approach to this type of fatigue prediction, um, which will contrast with you know what we see in FeSafe in a second. But um, it's, it's certainly a help to know how long we uh, structure could withstand a certain vibration level before we'd see a failure from fatigue. Right. So that's kind of a, a brief overview of everything that SolidWorks can offer from a fatigue perspective. And uh, if there are any questions or feedback, um, I'd certainly put it into the, uh, the question panel. Um, an alert watcher has identified why um, I was getting 500% damage, and it's because I told you I was going to put in 100,000 here and typed in a million. And um, that'll correct my damage percentage quite nicely, so thanks for that. And someone's asked if it's possible to get the PPT, and it certainly is. Um, if you're interested, there'll be a survey at the end of the presentation. Um, just put a note in there under the comment section that you'd like the PPT, and I'll get a copy to you. Otherwise, a recording of this presentation will be posted on our website within a couple of days in the uh, tutorial section of our website. So it's available for future viewing if you're interested. So SolidWorks uh, simulation offers you know, a pretty robust fatigue tool, but we'd still consider it an entry-level fatigue tool. Right? We only really have one methodology, which is a stressed life. We're using that stress as a prediction of the fatigue life. It's kind of been the bread and butter of fatigue analysis and fatigue theory for, for the last 60 years since the stuff was really developed. Um, but there are alternate methods, more detailed methods that we can get into. And the main tool that we'd advocate for that type of thing um, involves a move to, to our abacus portfolio. And when we talk about you know, this, this tool called abacus, it really is an extension to the capabilities of what's available in SolidWorks simulation. It allows us to get into more complex analysis types, more complex um, analysis scenarios, and you know the ability to apply more computing power to these analysis problems. And, and the fatigue environment is really no different. Right? So uh, there is a tool that's part of the Abacus portfolio called uh, FE Safe. Um, tool that's owned by Dassault Systems. It's a tool that we can bring to you, and that is a kind of industry-leading, really, really robust fatigue analysis tool. So let's take a look at what that does. If he's safe, it's kind of unique in that it is uh, doesn't care what sort of FEA tool you're using. As long as we can get a complete FEA output of all the nodal stresses and other information, which Abacus or Ansys or Nastran will be able to put out, FeSafe can perform um, fatigue testing on it. All right, and it can start as simple as, as using a single loading history, like we looked at with um, SolarWorks simulation, but can very quickly get up into very, very complex load histories, um, up to 4,000, and they can be time-based. They can be as complex as you like. Right? So you can instrument a version of your, of, of your component. You can put it out there. You can measure accelerations or loads that it sees through its life or over you know, 10 minutes of the test. Put those load histories in the FE safe and get a fatigue failure. Uh, it's available, able to assess both static loads, the static loads that are applied on and off, and fully dynamic loads, like random vibrations or 
fuel vibrations, and it does account for the um, for the dynamic nature of that of that loading, which is something that follow its simulation doesn't do, even up in the PSD realm. I can get into elastic plastics or post yield conditions, account for that properly in fatigue. It's really just doing everything at a much higher level of detail. And so this example here is um, for like a little component of a suspension. What you're able to do, which is pretty cool, is to take, you know, to instrument this device, put it out in the field, run it for, you know, a day or whatever, and get your traces out of the loading that it sees. But you can now come in and break this into blocks, right? You can say, hey, for the first segment, that was kind of a, that was a left turn. The next segment, that's a right turn. Um, the bit in the middle is just straight driving. Uh, section seven, that's a bunch of, you know, it's a bumpy road. And you can come in and say, you know, I want to do 100 left turns, 200 right turns, six hours of straight driving, um, you know, 12 hours on a bumpy road, and that's my fatigue life for this, this object. Take the, and it will take the chart, break out those segments, figure out the damage caused by each segment, sum it all up, and give you a prediction of fatigue life. So, for example, if, you know, we take that kind of formulation, obviously blocks one and eight contribute the most to fatigue failure, um, but when that's for a single um, repetition of each block, again, we're using that kind of minus law of cumulative damage, which is informing a lot of this. But when we go look at, you know, some of these blocks occur more often than others, um, you know, block six, which we had 600 repeats of, um, is obviously the biggest contributor to overall life, and that's a consequence of it both it being maybe a small contributor in terms of a single action, but it happens most frequently. And so we'd add all these up, or the software will add all these up, and we'll see if we're under 100% or not. Now, if he's safe, <coughs> does also really help you out from a material perspective. It has about 350 materials, but the, the information that's in there is typically starts with an SN curve. <coughs> Excuse me. But it goes a lot deeper. There's um, strain life formulations, there's other fatigue theories that are in place here built into these materials that you can search this database and really apply any of the fatigue theories that are available. And one of the <coughs> key things the software does that's, that's different from just a, a plain stress life approach is this thing called the critical plane method. And, you know, research has shown that if you've got multi-axial loading where the scale of the loading changes, so when you're loading it in a bunch of different directions, um, you've got to find the direction that the crack is going to want to form in. The cracks will form and develop <coughs> in certain directions. So we've got to understand the state of stress as we rotate through the, the middle of the component to find where the critical direction for fatigue activity will be. And these methodologies are built into the software. We can tell it to go to critical plane searching and it will automatically identify the exact, you know, the worst case position for the state of stress you have, do that across multiple load cases, and then give you a much more accurate prediction of you know, where the fatigue will occur and how it will happen. And it also has a methodology that's critical plane searching for, um, for random vibration loading. Uh, we using a PSD or a power spectrum density curve. And that particular, um, that PSD, critical plane searching, this is one of the few tools that's able to do that. And it's a very commonly requested feature. 
from fatigue experts. So we went, went ahead and ran this um, kind of same process with this component of the backhoe. Um, but we ran it against like something like 35 different loading actions. Right, we're looking at different sort of big and great events, looking at different angles of loading because this thing's going to move through a range of motion. Right, looking at um, different positions of loading. So we had that all set up in the, the FEA file. We did that in Abacus. We bring it into FEA-safe and run this combination of events um, to get a fatigue prediction. And then obviously we took it a step further and in the bottom there, you can see some different design alternatives. Right. Um, and in this case, blue blue is bad. Blue is less repeats. Um, so the design on the left is the worst one uh, and incrementally gets better through to design on the right, which does use more material. So there's a, there's a sweet spot in there somewhere, depending on what our design conditions are. So, you know, if we really just present this just to, to give you a sense that there are more options out there. Um, for, you know, entry-level assessments of fatigue, follow-up simulation is typically more than adequate. But if you're really looking into exploring, um, you know, the true loading history of your, your component or your part that you're designing over time, um, you want to do a really robust um, fatigue assessment that includes critical plane searching or cri the critical plane method. Um, if you safe is an interesting tool to look at and we'd be happy to, to share it with you. Um, now what, one of the challenges that we, we have, we talk to a lot of people every day about different analysis tools and we hear the same thing over and over again. It's that it's confusing to figure out what you need to complete a project. And to try and cut through some of that confusion, we put together something called the Simulation Bias Guide. Um, it has some information on fatigue in there. Um, so it's available on our website. Go to hawkridgesys.com, products, simulation. And um, what we tried to do is to present some of the, the choices that you need to make when selecting an analysis tool or analysis methodology uh, and put those in plain, simple language with pros and cons of each approach. Um, so I hope you find that pretty informative. Uh, the other thing we try to do here at Hawkridge Systems is provide assistance at the level at which you need it. Um, and that ranges from, from free offerings right through to, to, to paid offerings. And so you know, depending on the depth you need, um, we're here to provide assistance. You know, for free, we provide uh, a number of YouTube videos, we provide these presentations, uh, we've got a lot of information on our website and in our blog and we'd encourage you to check those, those avenues out. Uh, for our subscription service customers, we offer technical support um, and training courses are available for every analysis product we, we sell in the SolidWorks portfolio. And we can connect you with training for Abacus uh, or Simulia products if, if you need. Um, going a bit further than training, training provides best practices. We use sample models from the training manuals to teach you kind of how generally most people do different types of analysis. We can take that a step further and, and set up a mentoring package where we look with you at your specific design problem and propose a best practice that's specific to you uh, and developed in conjunction with you. And then you know, kind of the final step is if you don't want to be involved at all, or you don't have the budget or the time or the manpower to um, to take on these tools yourself, uh, we can provide consulting where we execute the job to your specifications for you and provide you with a report of the results. So that brings me pretty much right on time to the end of, of what I hope to cover today. Um, I'm here to answer any questions that you might have. Um, like I mentioned earlier, there is a survey form uh, that will go. You'll see it when you exit the presentation. If you're looking for information or you'd like to discuss anything in more detail, 
that's a great place to um, to make a note of it, and we'll follow up with you. But otherwise, I'd like to thank, and I'll be here for, uh, Tim and I will be here for a little while, taking a look at the, see if there's any questions or anything that comes through. But otherwise, um, we thank you for joining us today. We hope to see you at one of our uh, ongoing web Wednesday webinar presentations. Also, I'd like to tell you about sessions we run on Friday every week that we call our 3D Solutions Spotlight. And it's an opportunity to, to dr dig into a certain area of the software in more detail than we're able to today. This month, we're focusing on CAM, Computer Aided Manufacturing. Just a heads up, in May, we will be spending a lot of time talking about analysis topics. So keep an eye open for that. So with that, thank you very much for, uh, for your attendance today. Hope you found it useful. And we will um, kind of sit tight, see if, if any more questions come through. Um, but thanks again, and uh, we'll see you soon.